This is Justice, History, and the Law. Lectures, discussions, and interviews from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. Today's show comes from the International Humanitarian Law Dialogues at the Chautauqua Institution held at the end of August in 2010. Professor Michael Scharf quizzes a panel. Well, this is a real treat. Uh, We're going to have an exciting additional uh, speaker today. Um, We have joining us Bill Kaming, who you may have uh, been introduced to last night, but if you don't know him, he was one of the original Nuremberg prosecutors along with Ben Ferenz. He tried the Control Council Law Number 10 Ministries case, which was the only case um, that dealt with the crime of aggression. And so when we're talking about the crime of aggression, we're going to be able to get his insights uh, straight from the horse's mouth um, instead of uh, through the screen of history. Um, In addition on our panel, we have Ben Ferenz. If you were here this morning, I did a long introduction, but he was the chief prosecutor of the Eisensgruppen trial, which he tells me I mispronounce every time, um, and a lifelong advocate of the International Criminal Court and adding the jurisdiction over the crime of aggression to the ICC. We also have Bill Pace, Uh, You heard Ben this morning talk about a 16th century um, astronomer. Most people know Bill very well because he is the convener of the NGO Coalition for an ICC, which I think has over 3,000 NGOs. But they don't know that he was a college professor of astronomy. So somehow this all is coming together today. Um, And then we have John Washburn, who is the convener of the U.S. Coalition for the International Criminal Court. We're going to have a dialogue on the crime of aggression. The reason uh, that Greg said this is the Michael Scharf show is because in past years where I've been asked to do this, I've used the crossfire type of uh, approach. And what that means is I've talked to the panelists about the kinds of questions I'm likely to ask, but I will throw questions to them. They will give you rather short answers, and we will go through that. And it will be very lively, and then we'll open it up to the audience, and hopefully you'll have the bug and ask uh, questions as well. Um, I'm going to start with two points before I turn it to the first question. Uh, The first point is this. We don't have on this panel, as you can see, the major powers, um, which would be the U.S., the U.K., Russia, or China, who have certain concerns about the crime of aggression. And lest this be seen as completely one-sided, I do want to tell you a story that will at least get you to understand why a country such as the United States might not be the fastest advocate out of the box for the crime of aggression. The story takes place in 1998. It is at the tail end of a lot of atrocities that are going on in the former Yugoslavia, and suddenly there were reports of atrocities surfacing in the area of Kosovo, namely that the Serbs were burning, looting, killing, raping, and altogether uh, committing lots of crimes against the Kosovar Albanians as a way to ethnically cleanse that area. Over uh, 500,000 of them had gone up to the hills, winter was approaching, and the U.S. was very concerned that genocide would be raising its ugly head once again in the former Yugoslavia. The United States and the UK went to the Security Council. They asked for authorization to do humanitarian intervention to save these people's lives. But Russia, which was a historic ally with Serbia, and China, which didn't like the whole idea of intervening for humanitarian reasons, blocked it with their threatened veto. So the United States and its NATO allies got together and started an unauthorized bombing campaign. It lasted 78 days. About day 71 or so, there were two files that wound up in the office of the prosecutor of the former Yugoslavia. Serge, you, I'm sure, have heard this story by your colleagues. And if Dave Sheffer was here, he could tell it because he was personally involved. One file came from the law professors from Osgood Hall. And they said that the prosecutor, who had been a former a professor from their law school should indict the heads of NATO and their civilian leaders for all sorts of things. Um, if they could have, they would have thrown in the crime of aggression, but they had things like dropping bombs from too high, uh, not discriminating against civilians, using depleted uranium weapons, and so forth. There was a serious concern among NATO countries that the prosecutor would 
follow through with that. And in fact, the prosecutor's office opened up a preliminary investigation. About the same time, David Sheffer sent Mike Newton up to uh, meet with Louise Arbor, and he gave Mike, uh, she, a giant box of all sorts of intelligence information that the Yugoslavia Tribunal had been wanting for years. And And the U.S. said, look, now you've got the goods, go after Milosevic. And on that day, two things could have happened. The, well, three. The International Criminal Court could have, or the Yugoslavia Tribunal could have done nothing, or they could have indicted the NATO countries, or they could have indicted Milosevic. I guess there's a fourth thing. They could have indicted both. Now, under most of those scenarios, this would have been a huge setback for U.S. foreign policy. People said it could have been the end of NATO itself. But fortunately for NATO and for the United States, Luis Arbor ended up indicting Milosevic. He said that the jig was up. He sued for peace. The bombing campaign ended, and we had a transition from power ultimately. How different the world would have been if the indictment had been against NATO. That's the chilling concern that the big countries have when they think about an ICC. They're not afraid that the ICC is going to get their hands on them any more than al-Bashir seems to be. What they're afraid of is an indictment that can ruin their foreign policy at a really tricky moment in history. And that is not a concern that anybody should take lightly. Now, having articulated that, I have to tell you, I still advocate an ICC with the crime of aggression. Now, the second story I want to tell is what happened at Kampala from my point of view. It's a tale of three speeches. Um, Stephen Rapp reminded me that I had described him in a a speech I gave about a month ago at the U.S. um, Washington Press Club. Uh, He was the first of the three Americans to take the floor at Kampala. And the way I described his speech was sort of the version of Kennedy's... been ein Berliner speech. Uh, Basically, Stephen said, everybody, you know me. You know I've been a prosecutor at an international tribunal. You know that I love international justice and that I think the International Criminal Court is a great institution. And so when I tell you that the crime of aggression is bad for the court, please trust me and take me seriously. Um, You'll be hearing much more from Stephen tonight when he gives his full speech at 8 o'clock, and and hopefully he'll um, tell us what's going on behind closed doors in the U.S. as its position evolves. The second speech was by Harold Coe about a week later. And I call this speech 100 questions and concerns, no answers. And basically he was just saying these are all the things that we have concerns with. And it's the kind of speech that the State Department often gives when it's trying to kill the momentum for some kind of an initiative. But the momentum continued, as we said this morning. A lot of that had to do with Ben Ferenz, the NGO coalition, like-minded countries. It was sort of like the Grinch who stole Christmas. He couldn't keep it from coming. So the crime of aggression was building up. And then you had the third American speech by Bill Litzow. And Bill Litzow had been a military member, very well respected. It's almost like you know only Nixon could go to China. Only Bill Litzow, a member of the military, could have given this speech. And the speech was sort of thought about compromise. And I think it signaled that a big concern that everybody had, um, which was that the United States would be so upset with a crime of aggression being added to the statute that it was going to grab its marbles and go home and say all sorts of negative things about the International Criminal Court. Um, And Bill signaled that that might not be the case. If the compromise was very nuanced, if it was written in certain things, if certain concerns could be met, this could be something that everybody could leave Kampala with some measure of happiness or content. Um, So having given that kind of introduction to give you the flavor, now I'm going to turn the first question to um, Bill Pace to ask him to explain the compromise that was worked out in Kampala. You can just do that from there. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Basically, uh, the Rome Statute uh, creates an independent international criminal court. Uh, That is, it's a standalone treaty body and a new international organization that the governments that ratify the Rome Statute uh, pay for, and they are the governing body of. And it has, it's one of the most amazing uh, treaties that's ever been uh, drafted in international law in terms of the independence of the prosecutor, independence of the judges, the uh, advances in gender crimes, and I could go on for a long time. It, it does not hold states responsible for crimes. It holds individuals responsible for crimes. 
And the governments picked initially the three crimes which almost all of the governments had ratified uh, in international humanitarian law, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, and genocide, crimes of the Genocide Convention, of the Geneva Conventions, uh, and uh, in terms of crimes against humanity, customary international law. And again, it holds the individual responsible. So when the governments in Rome listed the crime of aggression, uh, the, the, it would be following the same track. It wouldn't be holding a state responsible, but it would be holding an individual responsible for a crime. In this instance, unlike the other crimes, the crime of aggression has to be committed by a state. It's a state acting. The definition that uh, was agreed to in Kampala um, is for the purpose of this statute, the crime of aggression means the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by a person in position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state of an act of aggression which by its character, gravity, scale constitutes a manifest violation of the charter. The second paragraph uh, describes the act of aggression, uh, again, uh, means the use of armed force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state, or in any other manner inconsistent with the charter of the UN. And in it, then it describes specifically invasion or attack by armed forces of a state or territory of another state, or military occupation, however temporary, uh, bombardment by armed forces of a state against the territory of another state, the blockade of ports or coasts of a state by armed forces of another state, the attack by armed forces of a state on the land, sea, or air, et cetera. So well, this can is I the, interrupt you for just a second? Um, when you were reading the definition, I happened to hear that you used the words a manifest violation. And I remembered that uh, Ben mentioned this morning that there had been a huge debate for a long period of time about whether to use the word manifest or egregious. And I think the first of all the compromises that comes out of Kampala is the insertion of the word manifest. Can you explain why that was put in there and what that does or it's intended to do? Uh, I think that there could be, the, that, that the governments that wanted some qualification of the term violation of the UN Charter uh, wanted to have a term like manifest so that it, it, it was, uh, in their minds, uh, would, would uh, mean that this is a violation that was in contrary to a decision of the Security Council or uh, inconsistent with Security Council resolutions or inconsistent with the, with the charter. It wasn't kind of a neutral manifest violation, but it was a a egregious, if you wish. Uh, so so just like um, not all war crimes are covered by the ICC statute, right. just those part of a policy and plan, not all acts of aggression, but just those that are particularly egregious or something that meet this manifest definition. And this was so that a case like I described, the bombing uh, in 1999 of um, the former Yugoslavia for humanitarian reasons might not be covered. Right, right. Okay. So the, yeah. in this compromise, uh, the definition and the individual responsibility uh, uh, language has been agreed to by a unanimous agreement that is a consensus agreement of the governments, the state parties in Kampala. Uh, no country objected. And in the room were all of the permanent five members plus the Indias, Pakistans, Egypts, uh, all of the countries, which is one of the most uh, significant note things to, to note about this. Uh, the second aspect of the definition then was how would the court exercise jurisdiction? And uh, essentially the compromise uh, that was agreed to was that uh, uh, the, if, the, if a country uh, referred a matter or if the uh, if there was a belief that aggression had occurred, uh, the prosecutor would write to the Security Council and ask the Security Council if they had determined whether an act of aggression had occurred. Um, the, uh, if the Security Council 
uh, said yes and referred a matter to the court, or if they had, without the prosecutor or anyone doing anything, referred a act of, uh, what they considered an act of aggression to the court, then the court would have jurisdiction. And, and this would be over both parties to the statute and also non-parties, right? The, the, the Chapter 7 right. uh, a power applies to members of the United Nations. So any state that is a member of the United Nations uh, has to uh, submit to the authority of Chapter 7 right. authority. Um, if the council didn't act within six months, uh, then the prosecutor could go to the pretrial chamber of the ICC and make the case that a act of aggression has occurred and that she or he has evidence of, uh, of the crime of aggression. And if the pretrial chamber could make a decision then uh, on whether the prosecutor had the evidence or didn't have the evidence. And as you've heard in, in testimony in the previous uh, panel, uh, sometimes the judges have said the prosecutor had the evidence, and sometimes they've said the prosecutor didn't have the evidence. So uh, it, it, it is an independent court. It has been demonstrating so, And itself. Bill, if, if we consider this to, then two tracks, the Security Council referral track and this um, prosecutor going to the court and the independent court track, which countries does the independent court track apply to? Um, uh, well, I need to, to qualify one more time. Now, the, still, even if the pretrial chamber approves and the prosecutors to go forward, still the Security Council would have another bite at the apple in terms of adopting a resolution under Article 16 that says to the court, no, nah, don't go forward with this at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a number of checks and balances over the court being exercised the jurisdiction. Now then, in addition, the treaty that was agreed to in Rome um, will treat this uh, fourth crime very differently than it will treat the, the war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. In those three crimes, uh, once a government ratifies the treaty, they accept the jurisdiction of the court for those crimes when their nationals committed or when the crime is committed on their territories. On the crime of aggression, it is uh, quite uh, a, a mess, uh, if you wish, of, of those principles. So that first, uh, a state party that files a declaration saying they do not want to accept the jurisdiction of aggression, that is this amendment, therefore their nationals and their territory would not be subject to uh, the jurisdiction of the court. So countries can opt out. Countries can opt out, but opt out plus, because they not only are able to opt out, but if their nationals commit aggression on another country's territory, because they're a national of, the, of a state party and they've opted out, the court would not have jurisdiction even in, in the situation like that. Uh, then secondly, non-state parties, which uh, are barely mentioned in the Rome Statute in this amendment have been given tremendous uh, attention and so that a government that is not, a, is not a state party to the Rome Statute, its nationals and its territories are, are exempt from the jurisdiction of the court, with again the caveat except when the Security Council would refer a matter. So for example, if the United States were to be accused of committing crimes against humanity in the territory of a state party like Afghanistan, even though the U.S. is a non-state party, its officers can be tried, can be prosecuted. But if the accusation is for the crime of aggression, doesn't apply at all to non-state parties, no matter where they commit their crimes. That's correct. Okay. So, so uh, one or two other provisions here is that the, um, the uh, governments uh, agreed that they would not proceed with this jurisdiction until after January 1st, 2017. And at that point, uh, this, the, uh, the governing body, the Assembly of State Parties, would have to basically have a, a two-thirds vote and agree to turn on this jurisdiction. In addition, there's another requirement that 30 countries need to ratify the amendment uh, for the amendment to enter into force, and this is 
common in treaties that they come up with a number of states that need to ratify a treaty for the for the that amendment to take effect. So uh, this is the compromise, and then a the quick summary is that uh, going in, as others mentioned earlier today, uh, th there were many countries that felt there would be no agreement on aggression. M many of us believe there would at least get this first piece, the definition of the crime of aggression uh, and the act, and that would be able to be put into the, in the chart. But the ability to um, uh, have jurisdiction and to resolve the differences on jurisdiction and have an agreement on how uh, to amend the treaty uh, was not thought possible. But against all expectations, and as I said, not just the 100 and, about 130 countries were there, uh, state parties and all of the, the permanent members of the Security Council and the India's. Malaysia's, Indonesia's, Egypt's, uh, Pakistan's, etc., and then this was agreed to at one in the morning by consensus. This is a, whether you like it or not, and I think there's hardly anyone who who feels like will satisfied with the agreement and the compromise. But this was another example of international lawmaking of historic proportions occurring and once again, uh, almost completely ignored by the international uh, press. Uh, for people like uh, Bill Chavez and Michael Scharf and, uh, and Valerie and Layla, this is the best gift that a treaty body has given to international law professors in, in uh, well, 50 years probably, because this will be a gift that will go on for a long day. There are kids in elementary school that will be able to do doctors on, uh, on this uh, uh, compromise. And, uh, well, let me ask the next question then to Ben. In your remarks this morning, you, I think everybody knows you're, you're an eternal optimist, and yet you're a little bit skeptical about the compromises that were just described. Do you think Kampala represents more of an incremental process toward something that you'd like to see or more of a smoke screen? More than a what? A, a smoke screen. In other words, some, some compromises, nothing good ever comes out of them. Well, it's both. Uh, let me see if I can clarify a bit uh, the point which uh, Bill started with. In connection with the crime of aggression, it is different from the other crimes because no individual can commit aggression. Aggression has to be of concern to the international community as a whole, has to be a massive, and they illustrate it, invasion, attack, and so on. No single individual can commit that crime. On the other hand, a state cannot commit a crime either, because it's not a human body. And this was determined in Nuremberg. You can't take a state and lock it up. Uh, a state has to be judged to see whether it has done an act which is a violation of the UN Charter and therefore is illegal and justifies certain restraints or sanctions. It's similar to a policeman arresting somebody first, bringing him to the district attorney, having the district attorney examine the evidence, see whether he needs more investigation, going to a jury of some kind before it's submitted to the court. The big complaint always was that you have to be sure that the court is independent. And of course the court has to be independent. But it doesn't mean that every time a policeman arrests somebody, or every time a district attorney examines the evidence, or every time it goes to a grand jury, these are interfering with the independence of the court. In connection with an act of aggression, which can only be committed by a state, who determines that it's a legal violation of the charter? Shall it be 18 judges elected as criminal experts, or will it be the politicians who sit in the Security Council and have been charged with the UN, in the UN Charter to do that job? That's their job. It's the job of the Security Council to determine the existence of an act of aggression, not a crime, an act of aggression, and then to decide what is necessary in order to maintain the peace. If you keep those two things separate, a crime committed by an individual as a leader who directs the troops to go in and bomb the country or whatever, uh, and 
a violation of the UN Charter by a state, you have to have both of them, just as you must have an arrest by a policeman before you can take him to court. It doesn't make the court dependent upon the police department. There may be polit policemen who are crooked, who are stupid, or whatever. It doesn't affect the action of the court. So I think what Bill was trying to explain was this dispute between an act of aggression and a crime of aggression, which is quite confusing to most people. And I must say, I was criticizing myself after Kampala for not having made that sufficiently clear to governments, that it is not really an infringement on the independence of the ICC to allow the Security Council to determine whether the actions by a state are a violation of the UN Charter. In fact, it's required. The UN Charter is the agreement reached by all nations who are member states to be bound by those procedures. If an act occurs of violence, the use of armed force, and it's in violation of the Charter, the Security Council will determine whether it is a violation or not. Maybe it was the kind of humanitarian intervention, which was referred to in connection with the Kosovo thing you started off with. So I think if you bear in mind those two separate functions, each one is necessary for a conviction. If you haven't proved that the crime has occurred, you cannot commit, convict anybody. You have a whole row of prosecutors here. The first question is, did the crime occur? That's not for them to determine. That's for and as far as the use of armed force illegally, that's for the Security Council to determine. Now, I know everybody hates the Security Council because they have failed miserably to do their job. They were supposed to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Have they done it? I'd give them an F, flunk them out. <laughs> they haven't done it at all for reasons which we know, Cold War and so on. Sovereignty, the sanctity of you know independent judgments and so on. So. The Security Council, everybody hates the Security Council. And when they hear Security Council involvement, no, it affects the independence of the court. Not so, not so, on the contrary. Except then, uh, if, if you only left it with the council. We don't leave it only the yes, council. The council then, has no then authority the, then except- the five permanent members and anyone they're protecting would never be subject Just a moment. to a jurisdiction. This council is charged with responsibility under the charter not to determine the guilt of anyone. They are not qualified to do that. They are not expected to do that. They are there to determine whether the use of armed force has been in a manner prohibited by the terms of the UN Charter, and if so, what action will be taken by the Security Council in response thereto? They may decide to refer to a court for punishment of the main perpetrator, that they may do. Uh, but these are two separate and distinct functions. Let me go on to illustrate with the Kosovo situation. So this is something which, if properly understood, I think some of the animus about the Security Council, which we all hate, let's all agree we all hate the Security Council. We don't hate it. Well, he loves it, but I, lo I, I, don't, lo I don't love it. I think they've failed in their job, and I think it's a shame, but uh, that's the way the world is set up, and we try to improve it. Uh, and we'll get to it in due course. But let's take your, your, your basic question is, you know, is it eyewash or is it, uh, is it progress? Is that what you're asking me? Is it a whitewash or progress? Is, is it eyewash or is it progress? Yeah. What do you make of progress? And it's both. It's both. The uh, manifest violation, which you refer to as one of the compromises, I think that's pure eyewash. Uh, the Rome Statute provided, based on Resolution 3314, the resolution in 1974, reached after about 20 years, building on a previous 30 years of definitions, was a consensus definition of the crime of aggression. That's what that was all about. Now, at the last minute, since they couldn't get agreement on it, somebody, and I know who it was, it was my friend Bob Rosenstock, now deceased, who said, hey, look, we can't reach agreement. We've been working on this thing for 29 years. Everybody's getting tired of it. Let's do this. Let's say it's only advisory. It's advisory to the Security Council. Then advisory, you don't have to pay attention. It has no biting effect. Okay, that was a compromise. 
make it advisory security council. That was not the purpose of 29 years of work. The assignment by the first General Assembly of the United Nations was to build on the Nuremberg principles, create a code of crimes against peace and security of mankind, and start building an international criminal court to enforce that code. That was the assignment in Resolution 29, the first Assembly of the General Assembly after the World War II. And at the end, they switched it around. So you're talking about hocus pocus. I'm showing you how the game is played. An well, old magician. Ben represents now, Ben. I'll go on but, some, uh, some more. Bill Pace, let me ask you, um, since you have 3,000 NGOs under your umbrella, what's your perception of how your coalition thought of uh, the results of the Rome Conference? The Review Conference or the Rome Conference? I'm sorry, the review conference, thank you. <laughs> the Re Rome conference, they are, that's why we have so many. Yes, yes. Um, I, again, I think uh, the amendment is a very complicated, uh, it's legally complicated and it's politically complicated too. And, and honestly, I think uh, most of our groups, even the groups that have uh, fairly significant legal departments are still trying to analyze how uh, they think uh, this may or may not work. Uh, uh, in short, I think uh, two or three things that I should mention here. One is that uh, some of our members did not think aggression was the kind of a jurisdiction that the court should have, and so they will remain uh, neutral on the issue. Uh, uh, some of our groups very much wanted aggression, but they did not want a, an aggression in which all of the countries that commit aggression could opt out and therefore never be subject. Their, their, their leaders never would be subject to the jurisdiction, and they will be very reluctant to support uh, the amendment. And others who will see a longer-term view, I think, will see that for their government, they should uh, ratify uh, the definition that you should try and secure the 30 ratifications uh, and continue to put pressure uh, uh, on the Assembly of State Parties to activate the jurisdiction. And if after uh, 10 or 15 years it's clear that the current amendment did not work and will not uh, help us uh, prohibit this uh, uh, plague spot on civilization of, of aggressive acts of war, uh, then we have to come back to the Assembly of State Parties, and they've built in a review conference uh, seven years after the, the, the amendment enters into force uh, to review it. So, uh, so I think there will be these, at least these three different uh, kinds of positions. I think a, a nuanced fourth position will be country, groups that don't want their country to opt out. Uh, that are, have, are one of the 113 countries that have ratified, and they will campaign against their country uh, taking an opt-out of the crime of aggression. Um, and, uh, and lastly, I should mention that the vast majority of members of the coalition work on human rights issues, advancement of women issues, victims issues, humanitarian issues, conflict prevention, peaceful settlements of dispute issues, etc. The The uh, issue of the legality of war is not in the mandate of that nonprofit organization. And so a, a, a wide range of them simply didn't, don't have this as a primary uh, a goal that they, their boards or their membership uh, have a strong opinions on. And therefore, I think it's going to take us a number of years to see uh, what happens. And I think no matter what would have happened uh, uh, in, in Kampala, it would take several years to get the number of countries for the treaty to enter into force. So it would take three or four years no matter what. They've given seven years. So we have a length of time now uh, to work with it and to see uh, what was agreed to, do the governments agree on what was agreed to, and are the how are the governments going to move forward on it? With uh, your respect to your last comment, and I know this is what Ben wants to say uh, probably too, is um, yeah, the, the Hans Peter said in his um, presentation at lunch that all of those other concerns that these other NGOs have are quote the excrement of war, so they ought to be very concerned about outlying war, um, and I, I think that's something that, that Ben has said over the years. Let me turn to John Washburn, who's been very patient. Um, your organization focuses on the U.S. relationship with the International Criminal Court. 
What do you think the effect of Kampala will be on the U.S. approach to the ICC and its relationship with it? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate everybody being here this afternoon. And it's also a real pleasure to be on this panel with uh, people, most of whom I've worked with for a long time. And I consider my friends, supporters, and mentors. Uh, Michael has told you that my organization, which is the American NGO Coalition for the International Criminal Court, uh, does work, uh, and we are the only organization in the United States that works on exclusively on the International Criminal Court all the time. Uh, we are a very small and much more modest version domestically of Bill's International Coalition. We have 32 nationwide uh, NGO members, and that we are present in 13 places around the country through various liaison groups or individuals who work with us. Uh, we've been working on this issue since it was convened as a program at the United Nations Association in 2002. I'd be very happy to talk with any of you who would be interested uh, in following up uh, about what we do and ways in which uh, you might be better, more informed, or like to work with us. I have cards here. Be happy to talk to you. Uh, <clears throat> I've been asked to address uh, taking the outcome of Kampala uh, as a starting point. I've been asked to address what we see as the impact of the American experience in Kampala on the development of the further relationship and interaction between the U.S. and the ICC. Uh, I may be a little hampered here because I have right in front of me the Ambassador for War Crimes issue, Mr. Rapp, who is a central figure in this and who, of course, is a target of the advocacy of my organization. Uh, he will have a right to reply, and it may be a pretty extensive one later today. Uh, <clears throat> the, as just one sentence or two of background. The Obama administration came into office with a campaign statement that uh, the Obama administration uh, looked favorably upon the ICC as a part of its overall commitment to uh, the use of multilateral institutions and activities in its foreign policy, but that there would have to be a formal policy about the ICC uh, which would have to have the full participation uh, in development and the full agreement and results of the Department of Defense, a rather characteristic combination of Obama broad vision and caution at the same time. The, um, when we first began to interact shortly after they were confirmed with legal advisor Co and Ambassador Rapp, uh, we found a combination of things. We found a very strong uh, commitment to the ICC as a matter of principle and under a much better understanding uh, of what it did, how it works, and what it was about than was the case in the previous administration, uh, and it, also a certain anxiety and caution, which was, I think, understandable. Uh, they had an action-forcing event before them, which was the review conference. Uh, they had to decide what to do about that. Uh, a decision about going to the review conference clearly involved a decision about whether, after an eight-year absence, the United States would start going again to the court's governing body, the Assembly of State Parties, which is to the ICC, what the General Assembly is, uh, to the UN. Uh, we were also, we were impressed by the care with which they approached those decisions. We were also impressed by their sense of realism. Like all incoming people, they started with a certain number of presuppositions. They were quite prepared to test those presuppositions against uh, investigation, action, and consultation. And some of those presuppositions were abandoned in the course of making the decision to go to the Assembly of State Parties, and in particular, in crafting the diplomacy that they used there. OK, so much for background. The, you've heard about, at length, what happened in Kampala. I would remind you that uh, the Kampala conference, the last week was about aggression, but there was a first week in Kampala, which was committed to an activity called stock taking, which was essentially an assessment through a series of panels, groups, discussions, and so forth, 
uh, of the current state of, the, of international criminal justice at large, and in particular of the ICC and its role in that system of international justice, a system which, because of the ICC's preeminent place, is now beginning to be called the Rome system of international criminal justice, or international atrocity law, as uh, a term that uh, uh, David Sheffer and others have begun to introduce, and which I find it useful to use, since for a lot of people, referring to war crimes and things like that as international humanitarian law has a certain contradictory flavor. The, um, I think that the U.S. — I'll get back to stock taking in a moment, because that did have an influence uh, on the subsequent attitudes of the U.S. — developing attitudes of the U.S. toward the ICC. Uh, the, to my observation and to those of many working with me, backed up by subsequent conversations we had with people in government in Washington thereafter, it was quite clear that the U.S. went away from Kampala very well satisfied with the outcome. Uh, it's already been emphasized to you, so I don't have to be the only skunk at the garden party, uh, that uh, a feature of this is that any country which is paying attention, whether it's a state party or a non-state party, can completely avoid forever and ever the jurisdiction of the court over the crime of aggression. I think probably that this was an outcome that the U.S. hoped for, was, but was not at all sure that it would be able to get uh, in quite such a sweeping way. Uh, and I don't blame them for being extremely pleased that this was the outcome. Uh, it, was some, it was a very good result to be able to take back the people in Washington who were nervous about the U.S. engaging with the court in this way and attending these meetings. Um, I think it also uh, uh, made the court, made the Americans feel, made the U.S. feel that uh, uh, U.S. diplomacy could be deployed even as a non-state party uh, in the work of the court in, uh, in such a way that normally the U.S. should be able to achieve most of its objectives, of course, taking into account the limitations on it as a non-state party. Uh, however, for a country as powerful as the United States, the limitations of being a non-state party means that instead of being the 2,000-pound gorilla in the room, you're the 1,800-pound gorilla in the room. Uh, the, um, the, uh, this outcome, uh, uh, I think, uh, gave a strong sense to the U.S. and to its, the leading figures in it that they had been on the right track in, the, in what they did and the approach that they took uh, coming up uh, to uh, Kampala. Now, uh, something else, however, since this first reaction has happened. There has been a certain complacency set in you know, from, in, from our observation. The Rome Conference challenge is over. Um, the uh, general approach of engaging with the court and going to the Assembly of State Parties uh, meetings and otherwise interacting has been confirmed uh, and has become generally accepted within the U.S. government as the right way to go about this. Uh, at the same time, there has been a great deal of developments and actions which have necessarily taken the attention of the leading figures, such as Ambassador Rapp and uh, Legal Advisor Co., onto other compelling issues like START, Central Asia, uh, Guantanamo, maybe Burma. Uh, and, this has, and this has had a consequence, which I will describe in a moment. But I do, I do want to say within that that uh, there are certain things that, whatever happens, I expect that the U.S. will continue to do, and I want to acknowledge that these are very positive and valuable things. The U.S. is going to stay open to wider assistance to the court generally, uh, and specifically in, uh, in cases which the U.S. considers to be in its national interest. I'm not aware that any case now before the court is regarded by the U.S. as not in its national interest. Um, secondly, there will be in particular ongoing discussion, support, and interaction with the prosecutor and the office of the prosecutor. And finally, there will be uh, interchanges going on with various parts of the court, including the presidency, largely conducted as a kind of an ongoing maintenance of relationship through embassy Hey, 
in The Hague. Uh, I can say very briefly that for the people in my coalition, the, uh, the organizations and the individuals, their reactions are very much the same uh, as those of uh, Bill Pace's uh, CICC membership. Whether you like it or not, whether you are willing to accept uh, Michael Scharf's excrement theory, the, f the fact is that a great many uh, uh, organizations that we work with and that are important to Bill and to me, nationally or internationally, simply do not have uh, the, con the legality of the conduct of war as a focus of their uh, mandate. Uh, as, a, as a convener in the U.S., and as Bill has said, as a convener uh, internationally, this is a reality we have to live with. It's one of the reasons why neither his nor organization nor mine have officially taken an institutional position on aggression. Uh, I don't, the uh, AMIC, my outfit, certainly isn't going to, and Bill's uh, organization and everything it says about uh, aggression has two the disclaimers top and bottom saying this does not reflect a position of the CICC. Now, uh, to, uh, a lot, there's a lot more I could say about this, but I want to focus on a particular point to wrap up with. And in talking about this, I particularly want to obviously address the Americans in this audience and particularly the uh, younger members of this audience, the generation which will be using the court before very long as an instrument of their occupation of positions of power and responsibility in the U.S., uh, including in the matter of foreign policy. Uh, a major consequence of Kampala from our point of view, uh, this may well not be a major consequence from the government's point of view, but it is for us, we had intimations before Kampala that the U.S. would no longer try to create a formal policy. Uh, on the ICC. And this stance has been confirmed to us repeatedly by various officials of the U.S. government afterwards. The, uh, what we are told is that it's no longer necessary to go through a policy-making, policy review process, even though such a process had begun earlier in the administration. No longer necessary to do that because the various speeches, statements, positions taken by the U.S. about the ICC cumulatively constitute a policy. Now, there are very serious problems with that. Uh, I just want to tick off a few. I want to say that in many ways the Obama administration has been so good about the court that it may seem churlish to, to object and to contravene in this way, but there are, and I'm just going to tick these off, a series of, for us, quite uh, important consequences uh, that flow from this. The, obviously, uh, in the United States, uh, we are, we look forward over time, and this is time in years, eventually to a ratification by the United States of the Rome Statute. Uh, Everybody knows how difficult it is to get a ratification. Everyone has heard the horror stories about never being able to get treaties uh, through the Senate for its advice and consent. The law of the sea is the leading horror story. Uh, everyone knows that you only get really one chance at getting advice and consent from the Senate, and if you don't make it, it goes to the end of a very long line. Achieving ratification, however, means a start now. And a start now means consciously developing a relationship with the court which will produce a relationship, a sense of familiarity and comfort by the Congress and the executive branch with the ICC that in due course can make it politically practical to try for ratification. Uh, this is a long-term perspective. Many uh, administrations normally don't pay an awful lot of attention to issues that are as long range as this because the people in charge now may well not be there in the future and they have to cope with urgent immediate problems. But for those of us who are committed to the ICC, uh, this is something we have to start working toward now. We believe that you can't get a relationship uh, with the court which will do what I've just said unless you have a policy matrix for it, a formal policy matrix for it. Uh, if you don't, you will have a situation where you do not have established machinery 
uh, in, the, in the government to deal with problems that may come up at the court. And we all, everyone, all of the people in this room who've had experience with international organizations know that sooner or later, something or some things are going to happen at the court that will deeply offend the United States and may feel that the court is going in a direction which is contrary to American national interests. When that comes, you want to be prepared to deal with it in a calculated, considered, uh, and thoughtful way. We saw in Rome the consequences of an absence of policy which could provide a uh, guidance to the delegation there when Washington finally woke up to what it was that were happening there. That could happen again if suddenly, unexpectedly, but almost predictably, we have a very negative development at the court that has to be coped right. with. John, we, we need to keep this going. So please, Michael, been... and I'll finish. The, May I? The, the, Not really. the issue here is that we need a policy which can produce uh, consequent, produce decisions on these emerging issues that are not less com lower common denominator issues, that are not plagued by the fact that disagreements between p different parts of the U.S. government have not been resolved. The policy process can resolve those disagreements, but it will be painful and difficult to do that. And the administration right now has decided that because of other demands on the Department of Defense and other reasons, it does not wish to go through that painful process now. Thank you. The Jackson Center is a historical and educational facility dedicated to preserving the legacy of this country lawyer who became Solicitor General, Attorney General, a Justice of the Supreme Court, and served as chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. To learn more about this program, Robert Jackson, the Jackson Center, and upcoming events, the Jackson Center is located at 305 East 4th Street, Jamestown, New York, and found on the web at www.roberthjackson.org or contacted by telephoning 716 483 6646. Six.